Good morning, everybody. It's uh, 1030, so we'll go ahead and get started. Thank you for joining me today. My name is Wendy Peliquin. I'm one of our business development managers at GIS, Inc. And today I'm going to talk to you um, about a case study from Opelika Utilities out of Alabama and really how they are becoming a modern-day enterprise GIS utility program. So I'm going to give you a little uh, insight into Opelika, uh, talk about how they have implemented a dead meter solution uh, using their Esri technology and insights. Uh, touch a little bit on what they're doing to migrate into the utility network management model and really the, the what's next. They're one of those organizations that's always trying to continue to evolve with the technology and take advantage of that. So as I mentioned, Opelika is located outside of Auburn, Alabama. Uh, they're a relatively small utility with about 16,000 meters, and they have um, really about 190 miles of main uh, miles of transmission mains and about uh, seven storage tanks throughout the uh, service area. So Opelika, when they first got GIS, it was something that they had. They had a license. It was there. Uh, one of the big things they started doing was a custom application for their hydrant inspections. And that was really the extent of what they had it. And, you know, one day they're like, you know, we, we, we don't want to customize. We want to have something that's, that's really off the shelf so we can deploy these solutions very quickly. And, you know, as the technology was continuing to evolve, there are a lot more solutions and templates that were readily available with their licensing. They, they really decided to embrace that and get rid of the, the customization because with it comes that maintenance and that cost and it gets really clunky to, to go in and make those changes. And so that was the beginning of their platform adoption. And at the same time, they realized that their network and their data was uh, definitely lacking and they were missing a lot. And so they were able to, you know, utilize the ops dashboard to be able to track the data that was being collected, what was being verified. They also implemented mobile data editing with ArcGIS Online out in the field. And that also allowed their crews to have access to those ads built drawings while they were out there, which is something they, they didn't have. They'd have to go back, uh, go to the office, pull the paper, look at it. And then one of the other big things was, well, we, we don't want to spend all this time figuring out who's affected. And so they also implemented the utility isolation trace so they could find out which customers, when they had to cut off a valve, um, needed to be notified. But the biggest piece of that was for their customer service. So they weren't just implementing this out with the field crews who were working there. When people were calling, they had a map in ArcGIS Online so their customer service could pull it up and they could see, oh, yep, you know what? They've shut down a valve. The main is broken. The next street over, they're working on it. And that allowed their field crews to, to keep on doing what they were doing. Before, every time customer service got a call, they were calling out in the field Field crew's like, yep, yep, we're here, we're on it. And so it just really opened up those lines of communication to, to make them more efficient and, you know, spend less time doing things that they didn't need to be doing. And so that, you know, for a couple of years, they're like, this is really great, this is really great. They started noticing there, there's an issue with dead meters. Meters are always going to die. And they knew, it was, they knew it was bad. They they worked with us to develop a customized script because they wanted to pull that utility billing data and replace them as soon as possible because when the meter's not reporting, they're not getting paid. And the script was able to identify a lot of those meters, but about the time that Esri released 10.5, there's this thing called Insights. And it was really allowing them to, to dig into the data. So the Esri water team invited them up to Philly to, to really do a, a BI workshop, that business intelligence, and recreate what they were having to do in that customized script. Because, you know, as I mentioned, the whole theme is let's get away from having to customize, having to maintain, and make our software and licensing work with us. So when we upgrade, when we move to something different, we're not having to go back and make a ton of changes and spend a lot of time and money on it. And so in a matter of really hours, we're able to recreate that workflow and process of bringing in that data. So for those of you that are still new to Insights, one of the great benefits is that you can bring in spatial and non-spatial data. So they were able to bring in, if you have your data in your database in GIS, you can connect to it. You can bring in Excel sheets as well. Um, 
And so from there, it's really, for those of you that have used Model Builder in um, ArcGIS Desktop, it's, it's very similar. So you can go in, you can put in your logic, your filters, to then create maps, charts, and tables. And so we did this with the utility billing. And so the great thing, obviously, you have to have a facility ID, a connector between the physical assets or the assets that are in your database in GIS and then in the utility billing. And from there, they were able to identify these are the meters that are dead. And for them, what constitutes a dead meter is one that's reporting zero over multiple months or reporting the same reading. And before they went to the customized script part, there was um, one of the people in their office would print a spreadsheet once a month and spend about eight hours manually going through, highlighting line by line which ones may be dead. Then they were looking it up, putting it in the system. And now this is something they go in, they run a button once a month, it refreshes the data, and they have the meters that are identified. And from there, they actually found out that about 20% of uh, the meters that they had in their system were showing up in that list. And when it comes to replacing that, it, it's not cheap. And so fortunately, when they were going out and doing their major data collection, when they were embracing the platform, they collected a lot of attributes. It wasn't just about getting the physical location of their assets. They wanted to know everything about it they could. And so they had the manufacturer's information. And so now they're able to go through, and when these meters are identified, break it down, and I think it's a little bit blurry on here. So you have the list in the bottom right, but in um, that top middle, it's the manufacturers, and you can see a summary. So they can go and find out who manufactured it, is it a bad batch? Maybe there was a whole subdivision where it was installed and now they're starting to see meters popping up in there. And if it's under warranty, they can go back and have the manufacturer pay to replace it. So they're not spending the hundreds of dollars out of their pocket when it could be paid for as part of um, what they already purchased. And so from there, it's, it's really that, that what's, next, what's next to go. Um, but one of the, the funny things is through this process, they were able to identify a car wash. And you think of a car wash, you're going, they're going to be spending quite a lot of money on their water bill every month. Well, they were spending not a lot of money on their water bill. They found out it was broken. They went. They replaced the meter. Well, the owner was not very happy. And a couple months later, it showed back up. And, and the team's looking at this. And, you know, it shows up on the list. They're looking in their um, asset manager work order system. They're like, this is... This is a brand new meter. There's no issues. They go out to investigate. Well, the owner of the car wash had disabled the meter, and he was consequently arrested, and they had to go to court to testify against him because that's a, that's a very big deal. So they're able to, you know, find those cases where people were, you know, not, not necessarily uh, being law-abiding citizens, but also those that, that were, and just making sure that getting that meter replaced. Because um, for them, that, that's revenue, that's money that they can invest in other technology and continue to move forward. And so at that point, as I mentioned, they're like, well, what else can we do? They decided they wanted to dig in a little bit into their service requests from their work order system. So looking at where are the locations, where are they spending a lot of their time. As you can see on the right um, from the data tree, they spend a significant amount of time reconnecting service. And being able to look at the location, looking at the months, they were also able to identify that there are some communities that are low-income communities, and they were spending a lot of time disconnecting and reconnecting service there. But with looking at when the bill was due, a lot of this, uh, those customers were paycheck to paycheck, and times are hard, but by adjusting that billing period for them, they were then able to, to make their payments and avoid those late fees and avoid it being shut off. So really being able to, to offer that better quality of life to their customers just by making one simple change in their system for the due date. And so then their crews are not spending time going out there and doing that where they could be doing other things. And, you know, a lot of it, it was really just helping them look at the resources that they had available. So service request. Then, of course, looking at the, the work orders, the starting months. When are they spending a lot of their time during the year? So if there are certain times, of course, in the winter, it freezes. Uh, and we'll talk about this a little bit. But, you know, when you have your water main age, a lot of those older water mains have the pretty much their they're going to be targets where they can potentially freeze. They're going to break. You're going to have to go out and replace them. And doing that in the middle of winter when the ground is frozen is, uh, is not a fun time. So 
being able to identify what needs to be replaced in their system and then taking this data and using it as part of their CIP process. So knowing, okay, we have X amount of pipes, uh, what's gonna be the cost, how can we put this in their program to start replacing them so then we're not gonna be spending time being reactive and spending a lot of that being proactive within their system. And so for them, uh, Esri's come out with a new utility network management model. And so as I mentioned earlier, they are in, um, they're currently using the Esri data model, they're using the valve isolation trace, and that's really one of the benefits for them for going to that new utility network. And it's really going to consolidate some of their data, um, and it's a really customized towards that water utility and what they're doing. And it was also an opportunity for them to, to look at their infrastructure and their environment. And so what they did is they stood up a new testing environment, and that's where they're really working on doing that, that data migration into the new utility network. Um, as they're already in the uh, Esri data model, it made it a much smoother transition for them. Uh, you don't have to be in the data model to go to the network, and but it was also that, that time to get to play, with, to play with Pro. We all know that Esri's <laughs> moving away from desktop, uh, it's, it's, it's going to be going away. Um, the geometric network is going to no longer be supported in, I believe it's 2024 and, or, yeah, I think it's 2024, and so they're wanting to, to get ahead of the game, but they're not ready to make that big leap. Uh, we know anytime new technology and software, just because you want to embrace it and you want to move forward, you need to do a lot of testing. Uh, they've been working directly with Esri on a lot of the, the bugs that they have found. They, they exist, they're out there, and, and it's actually really encouraged by them to report those and help make that system better. So they, they've taken a lot of pride in, you know, being one of the first utilities, you know, really embracing it moving forward and, and helping to, to really make it better for everybody else within the industry. And so in that testing environment, it's also giving them that opportunity to, to learn pro and get comfortable with it before they switch to their production environment and no longer utilize desktop. And it's also giving them, with continuing to move further into that web GIS deployment, Analyzing who, who has desktop, who's using it, do they even need to use Pro? Can we give them a web map where if they're doing very simple searches, they need to view the data, or they're only editing a simple thing, well, we don't have to spend 8, 10 hours, 16 hours training them in Pro. We can give them the web map, and they can easily go in and they can do it. We no longer have to have desktop installed. But for those that are going to be using Pro, it gives them the time to go in to play, learn how to edit their data in that new network, get comfortable with it, so when they do go live to production, it's gonna be seamless. They're not gonna have this downtime, they're not gonna be making um, these errors, they're gonna be comfortable. But another big thing, that testing environment, they have integration, so they are also um, CityWorks users for their work order management system. Uh, they are tapping in a lot to their utility billing, and anytime it comes to changing that data, well, for them, CityWorks, it, it runs off their services from their database. They're now completely, you know, they're changing their schema to go into this new network. So they want to test how that's going to work in the new system and really get that ready so that when they make the changes, it's not going to break or um, give them that downtime in CityWorks because that's they, their field crew lives and breathes what they're doing and all of their work orders. And then from there, as I mentioned, as they're identifying these mains, uh, assets in their system by digging in a little bit of the analytics within Insights, they're putting it into that capital improvement planning. And before, you know, I think the theme of the day is a lot of what they were doing were starting with spreadsheets. Uh, a lot of traditional cost estimation for them, it, it's a very tabular process. They're going through uh, getting how many uh, feet of the pipes, how many certain assets, giving that to an engineering firm that they're consulting with. It could take them a while to, to get that data and bring it back. Um, the group that they work with does use RS Means, uh, which is one of the really leading cost estimation um, companies out there. And they've, you know, really for over 75 years, they've been doing this, and they update their data quarterly. It's uh, localized to the three-digit zip code. So you can, you know, really get about 80% of the way there with the estimates, and, and that's what they want. And there's a lot of times where they didn't have those two weeks to wait for, 
you know, the company they're working with to go back. And with it being that tabular process, sometimes it's, okay, well, where was this? Where was this pipe? What project area are we looking at? And so within that database, it, it breaks things up between their material, labor, and equipment to get that total cost. And even, you know, as I mentioned, taking a long time with it being online using that software. And so uh, they started looking at a cost map. So RS Means has started to uh, partner with GIS Inc. And, and we help take that tabular data into the mapping format. So now they can do all of their cost estimation directly from a map. And Opelika was a big part of that. They're like, you know, this is something really cool and interesting. We already have the infrastructure, the platform, our data is in the data model. They wanted to be part of it because they're wanting to find quicker ways to be able to do their job. And so uh, this is a screenshot real quick and I'll uh, go to a demo in a second, but really being able to, to have that picture where you can go in and select the uh, assets and get those costs. So let's see if I can get it. All right, so within the system, you can go in, and all of you can see the different assets, uh, the water mains, the hydrants, uh, select your project area, which is the green polygon. And what it does when you select it is it summarizes all of your assets. So you can see the water mains, it summarizes by type, by size, uh, and gives you the cost. You can then break down and see it by the equipment, material, labor, trench, and get a better idea of how much you're spending, um, and then, of course, you can go and make changes. So if you want to change the material, it'll then automatically change those cost estimates on the fly. You can uh, export it to an Excel spreadsheet. And then you can also go in and view that. And because like I said, it'll get you about 80% there. So if there's any locality factors or you know, okay, well, we know there's about a 5% difference, you can go in, um, do that, but also put it in your other systems that you need to, to continue to move. Uh, your estimates along the way. You can also go in and, and draw. And so with that, you can select certain assets to get those cost estimations. So you don't have to have those predefined project areas in there. And you can go in and if you select that, add those assets to it, it'll automatically then um, update the cost based on that summary. So if you say, yep, this is good, we wanna look at it, but what if we added these other ones? You can deselect assets, so even the ones that you select within a group, you can go through, take it out, and all of this is dynamically updating those costs. And then you can also set that. So you can get break it down by, are you putting in new assets? Are you replacing or are you repairing those assets? And as I mentioned, you know, you can put in a little bit of that percentage for their uh, the cost estimation. You can also go in and uh, draw your own assets. So as you're looking at it, if there's an emergency, something coming up, you need to get that quick cost, you can, um, oops, this is not here. Uh, you can go in and, and dynamically draw that, and within seconds, you know, it was taking them two weeks to go in and get an answer. You know, drawing it, something, with, by the time they log in, they zoom to the area, they draw it in five minutes, they now have that cost. And so when they're in meetings, um, if the board wants to know, okay, well, what's this uh, project, what are we doing? That allows them to go through that quickly. So, oops, it's no longer duplicating my screen. So I'll just pull this over here. So, so really the part for that was the ROI, time. They're now able to incorporate this into their budgeting, and so they're getting an idea of, you know, not just, okay, well, here's the assets. Where are they located? Can they combine some of these and make it one overall project for a particular area? It's also, you know, really allowing them to negotiate their bond ratings. Better data gives them more confidence in what they're doing, which will allow them to get better interest rates. So, any questions? Nope, no questions. All right, well, thank you for joining us this morning. And uh, definitely, if you think of any questions later, uh, let me know. Or if you want to ever talk to Opelika and, you know, get an idea from them, I'd be more than happy to get you connected.